last talk of the of the afternoon. I promise I won't be too long. Uh, amazing history, Tim, and really wonderful for me to hear. I joined Bill Baruki at NASA Ames as he was putting together his own, I should say, kludging together his own uh, ground-based transit mission, which was or transit equipment robotic telescope up at Lick Observatory uh, called Vulcan uh, at the same time. So, and, and of course, all of that science that you talked about was instrumental, which I'll say I'll continue on talk about a little bit in, in a minute. So exoplanet science in the post-Kepler era, but I am going to start a little bit with Kepler, just very high level overview so we can understand the strategic priorities going forward. Uh, you saw this, um, a static plot of this already in a previous talk. I'm kind of curious to know how many of you in the audience were at the Cool Star Stellar Systems in the Sun meeting in 95 when Michelle Mayor announced 51 PEG. <laughs> Just you and I then. Seriously, that's it. It was a STARS conference. Um, it was on the last day, and he wasn't on the agenda, and he snuck into a brown dwarf panel discussion, and that's where he announced 51 Peg, and there was one lone television camera on the, on the side of the room. I was sitting in the back. You were in the front, and, and I think it was, it was very surprising. The, this histogram is nice because it shows that the doubling time for planet discoveries is about 2.3 years. And we do expect that doubling time to continue as a result of TESS and then W first. Well, TESS and PLATO. Um, PLATO will launch a little bit later, more concurrently with W first. And then I don't know. Then I think we're going to be done with this kind of demographic survey and maybe retreat inward a little bit and look at the nearest exoplanets. But for the time being, uh, this still holds. And you can see that the green bars are the transiting exoplanets. Most of our planet discoveries are through the transit technique simply because the sheer number of small planets far outweighs the number of the ice and gas giants. Um, and so it was very fruitful to have this technique that had sensitivity to Earth-sized planets come online. And so that was Kepler. Kepler launched in 2009 that very first proposal that Tim talked about was in 92. So it was proposed, for t proposed and rejected four times and was only selected on the fifth. And a lot of those people that Pim, Tim listed were on that proposal. I joined the project. I met Bill Baruki in 1999. And when I arrived at Ames, one of the very first things I did was rewrite the section of the proposal on the um, impact of stellar activity. In fact, I had sent Bill Baruki an email during my first postdoc saying, I heard you're doing this, proposing this transit method, and I was doing Doppler imaging of star spots. Like, I, I'm really skeptical because spots are going to produce a larger signal than the planet itself. And he said, well, as a matter of fact, that was what got Ed Weiler's goat, and that was one of the reasons why the previous proposal had been rejected. And so he invited me to Ames to study that problem and then to work on Vulcan. Um, it has been written. Now it's part of the history books. Alan Boss's book, The Crowded Universe, has this little footnote that I dissected out about the discovery of HD 209458 and how important it was for the success of that Kepler proposal. Uh, up until that time, I mean, Vulcan was built around the same time that Stair was built. He, Bill started his project in 97, and we were detecting tons of triple star systems, multi-star systems, background eclipsing binaries. We hadn't yet found a planet. Um, we got really close, but we didn't ever find a planet. And then Tim handed us one on a plate. And we immediately went and observed it with the Vulcan camera. We had a nice transit of it. In fact, it wasn't a full transit. I think it was about three quarters of a transit that we got <laughs> just before that proposal was due, which was in 2000. So that all came together very, very quickly. Um, but we did get about three quarters of that transit, and we put that figure into the proposal to show that we knew what we were doing. That no, we hadn't found any planets yet, but we were we were achieving the right uh, precision to do so. An interesting footnote. Um, I have to also make reference to Tim's work related to the Kepler input catalog. It was a very daunting task to think about characterizing. Actually, four and a half million stars were in the Kepler field of view. We wanted to know uh, the properties of about 1.5 million. And believe it or not, there was actually a proposal on the table at one time to take spectra of all of those stars. 
uh, we quickly realized that that was unfeasible and we reverted back to broadband photometry with a couple of narrowband filters tossed in for good measure. And here's something akin to an HR diagram um, that you see on the left that was from our final catalog, um, effective temperature versus stellar radius, which now, of course, we have Gaia, right? So now we have somewhat of a ground truth to plot radius versus effective temperature. Um, although the effective temperatures that Gaia are giving us, as you probably know, are, are have high uncertainties as well. We'd like to do better. And what I'd really like to see happen is for us to go back now with a subsample, this smaller sample of maybe, let's say, 90,000 stars, 80,000 stars even, the, the highest priority stars, and to go back and get those metallicities so that we can do nice occurrence rate studies as a function of these stellar abundances. Yes? Yeah, so uh, a mixture. So we have, have done spectroscopy of all of the planets or all of the stars that have, have interesting transit signals. And that's a lot, I mean thousands, thousands of stars. So where we have good spectroscopic temperatures, they supersede. Um, and then um, in this plot on the right-hand side, I think that we are sticking with the broadband photometry colors, not the Gaia uh, temperatures that are color derived and not the Gaia. So they're only superseded um, in the case where we have a spectrum. Yeah. So just a plug for metallicities and to go back and maybe use a multi-object spectrograph to get metallicities of the Kepler stars so that we can do occurrence rates. So Kepler's done, it's finished. Uh, and I just wanted to point out this little tidbit that you might not realize. Uh, that the demise of the Kepler spacecraft happened on the anniversary of the death of its namesake, Johannes Kepler himself, November 15th, separated by some 400 years. Total coincidence, um, but uh, yes, yes, that's the way it was. So here I've got the epitaph that Johannes Kepler wrote for himself. He wrote his own epitaph. I used to measure the heavens, now I measure the shadows of Earth. And so it's only appropriate that Kepler's epitaph be, I used to measure the shadows of Earth's. Plural. So the discoveries are nicely summarized in a radius versus orbital period plot. Um, this is what the scene looked like on the eve of Kepler's launch with 90% of the planet discoveries larger than Neptune. This is what it looked like some years later after the release of the final DR25 catalog. Now 90, 85 to 90% of the discoveries are smaller than Neptune. And we have this nice statistical sample of over 4,000 planets to do demographic studies with. And I adore this diagram. There is a lot of information in this diagram, and I'm going to circle back to it in a second. But Kepler was a demographics mission, so the purpose of Kepler was to study um, broadly, uh, do, do a, a census of exoplanets. And just highlights, I, I can't go into all of the science that was returned from Kepler, but I do want to emphasize that if you marginalize or, or integrate over all of the planet types, you get an occurrence greater than one, which means that the on average, every sun-like star harbors at least one exoplanet. And I say at least, I think that's fair because Kepler probed a, a finite part of parameter space, orbital periods closer than one astronomical unit, and down two sizes, maybe one Earth radius is generous. Um, we don't reach one Earth radius all the way out to one AU for all stars. Um, so, but hence the word at least. And you can do this exercise for habitable zone planets as well, and you come up with the result that the nearest potentially habitable planet is likely to be orbiting an M star within 3.5 parsecs. And of course, we have Proxima Centauri to confirm that result. Um, another result I think is tremendously important from Kepler is that the diversity of planets in the galaxy exceeds the diversity of planets in the solar system. I think that this is very profound. Um, and of course, there's all the exotica, right? The planets orbiting binary stars, um, the lava worlds with an ocean of molten rock, the photo disintegrating planets that we saw with the weird transit shapes, the ocean worlds people refer to. I'm still not convinced they actually exist, but maybe they do. Um, planets orbiting stars in open clusters, planets the age of the galaxy itself, and on the other end of the spectrum, planets in, in very young clusters. 
So there's just this huge cornucopia of exotica that we see. And I think this plot is probably the most intriguing to me if you just do a, a show a radius distribution of all of the observed planets, no fancy corrections for occurrence rates, you find that the most common type of planet known to us right now in our discovery catalogs is the gray area in between, the kind of planet that we don't have in our solar system, as you can see on the top. And this is what's already been referred to in this forum as the super Earths or sub-Neptunes. I've been starting to call them the bridge planets because our thinking in terms of solar system science is quite binary. We think of the terrestrials versus the ice and gas giants. We think of planets that have primordial atmospheres versus planets that have secondary atmospheres. And I don't think that this case is that black and white. I do see evidence of these, this bridge population that's going to have or exhibit a large diversity. Um, Another interesting thing from Kepler is taking the sample of stars for which, or the planets for which we could compute the mass using follow-up ground-based observations. For our own solar system, mass versus radius is this nice, well-behaved power law. Um, but exoplanets, at least the first mass discoveries, seem to follow that power law. And of course, we had to do ground-based observations and the Doppler method mostly to do this. But Kepler also gave us transit timing variations. And through the transit timing variations, we had dynamical information that gave us independent mass measurements. And so when you plot all of this on the diagram, I've got circles representing radial velocity masses and triangles representing transit timing variation masses. You can see that more or less they follow a power law, but the dispersion at every mass bin is larger than the error bars. There is a robust difference or diversity um, in radii at every mass. And we can plot these isocomposition curves to give us some idea of what that diversity is. Um, we've got curves here. I don't know if you can see the labels. They're brighter on my computer. Um, from a pure iron planet, which obviously doesn't exist, to a pure water planet or even a pure gas planet. Um, and just showing that, that diversity, even outside, even considering the error bars. Um, if the, the thing about this graphic is you, you will hear people say, well, if you look at only the masses that have very high precision and you go down to the Earth-sized planets, the masses will start to track the Earth isocomposition curve. And the problem I have with that statement is that all of those very precise masses are of ultra-short period planets that don't have atmospheres, whose atmospheres are stripped. Um, if they had a primordial envelope, it's gone. So really what you're looking at is a trace of remnant cores. Um, so I don't think that that alone speaks to the diversity of planets that are out there. We really need masses of planets that have low insulation fluxes. And it's only the transit timing variation method right now that's giving us those masses. And they all come from Kepler. We aren't seeing a lot of transit timing variations. We won't likely see a lot of transit timing masses from TESS due to the nature of the data span and duty cycle. Um, maybe an argument for flying another Kepler one day. Now, the theory of planet formation and evolution makes a strong prediction. If you look at the assembly of cores and you consider different core masses and how gas is accreted onto those cores to create primordial envelopes, and how those envelopes are then sculpted by irradiation from the parent star, those processes corroborate to divide the sample into two distinct populations, the mini-Neptunes and the super-Earths. That is, you, some of the planets will be able to retain their primordial atmospheres even in the face of irradiation from their star, and others will just lose it, and their radii will rapidly shrink as you get down to these uh, core sizes. And that prediction from theory was borne out in the form of an occurrence rate distribution as a function of planet radius that gave rise to the radius gap. And so here you see an occurrence rate distribution now in radius, and you see a gap. You see the population divided into two di distinct peaks. 
one to the right of 1.8 Earth radius and another to the left of 1.8 Earth radius. And the idea is that on the right you have planets with their gas-rich primordial envelopes and to the left you have mostly rock, but my guess is that you also have, there's increasing evidence that even to the left you have an admixture of remnant primordial atmospheres together with secondary outgassed atmospheres creating a diversity. And maybe it is there that the ocean worlds reside. So what I've labeled that as is rock or rock plus volatiles, which could be, for example, hydrogen-rich molecules, maybe not hydrogen gas. And so here's another way of looking at this diversity. This is for, now this graphic was all of the Kepler sample doing a, an occurrence rate calculation. Now you collate that sample or you parse that sample for those that also have mass measurements and then you can plot density versus radius and the same bifurcation is seen there. You've got this distribution of small planets that are rock or rock plus water, and then you've got the other distribution down in the bottom right of those that have retained their primordial gas envelopes. So even with this subsample, you see, you see the bifurcation. But what I want to draw your attention to, and lamentably without error bars, I apologize for that, it's not my plot, um, the population of the rocky or rock plus water planets themselves have a large dispersion. And this is what I mean by evidence, growing evidence of compositional diversity even amongst the small planets. And that's going to have implications for life. But all of the evidence that I've presented so far is related only to bulk properties. We're measuring the bulk properties of exoplanets and trying to infer information about that diversity. Um, we can do a little bit better. Let me go back to the period radius diagram and outline some populations. So we talked about the hot Jupiters up there in the upper left, and when you look at the full sample, it looks like there are a lot of hot Jupiters, but that's an observational bias because those are the planets that the ground-based surveys could see quite easily. Um, as Tim already mentioned, the occurrence of such planets is only something like 0.5%, point, a half of 1%. Um, but they are plotted there with their actual radius, and you see that they make a large clump. There is a dispersion of their radii. There's also a hard wall that's somewhat diagonal going from the upper, right, upper left downwards. Those are features that will quantify physical processes that are affecting these planets, like tidal heating in the cores that lead to radius inflation or irradiation from the external star which inflates the atmosphere. So by doing occurrence rates not just in bulk and saying 0.5% but actually looking at the details of the shapes of these distributions, maybe the size dispersion of giant planets as you go from the hot Jupiters to the cold Jupiters for example, will have information about the physical processes. The cold Jupiters over here, you can see the blue points are mostly radial velocity detections, transits out at that long orbital period. I think we're out at almost 1,000 days there. The transit probability is exceedingly small. We don't have a lot of transiting planets. Um, but if you focus your eye on the yellow points, kind of the sea of yellow points behind the cold Jupiters and leading up to them, you can see that the distribution of yellow points is pretty constant as you go from the hot Jupiters over to the cold Jupiters. There's kind of a sea of yellow points that are constant, despite the fact that the transit probability is decreasing. So we are already beginning to see the upturn of occurrence rates as you go from the hot Jupiters to the cold Jupiters and you cross the ice line, which is exactly what you'd expect from a core accretion model. So that's very valuable information there as well. We want to map out that gradual rise in occurrence as you approach the cold Jupiters. Um, this edge, I think, is very interesting. This edge is marking either, it's either it's tracing out the size of core masses or it's demarcating a migration breaking boundary, both of which are very interesting physical processes that we want to know about. So we will take this sample, we will split it out by the mass of the central star, 
Um, one day I would love to do that with metallicity as well because metallicity is likely a driver for core masses um, to understand those physical processes. And then you've probably already noticed that there's a void, a triangular kind of bird beak shaped void of planets there on the left and I call this the photoevaporation desert where there are not zero planets but very few. And the idea is that planets that wander into that region, two things are going to happen. If the planet is larger than Neptune, it likely has a core mass that is large enough to retain its primordial atmosphere. The solar or the stellar irradiation combined with tidal heating will then inflate the radius of the planet and it will move up in the diagram out of the photoevaporation desert. If the planet is smaller than Neptune, its core mass is lower, it has a harder time retaining its primordial envelope, and so it migrates inwards, and its envelope is going to be stripped, and then it quickly moves down, thereby clearing out that area. But it's very interesting to note that there are some planets, transitory planets in that region, and those are very interesting planets to study. And then the radius valley that I already described is often confused with a photoevaporation desert because they're related processes. The, the radius valley is also sculpted out by photoevaporation. Um, and the two areas are likely connected. The way I think about them in this diagram is I imagine the radius valley is kind of a, a grand canyon or a, a canyon that's being sculpted out and then broadens and widens into the photoevaporation desert. Um, so we're, there are also theoretical predictions for how the radius valley, the location of the radius valley changes with orbital period. So we want to measure that very carefully and that's why I've given that line a little bit of a slope. Um, there's already preliminary evidence that there is such a slope, but we want to look at that very carefully. Okay, but the next era is the era of atmospheric characterization. It's just a nice cartoon. I wish the scale height of our atmospheres <laughs> was this high. Um, it's not, as Tim pointed out, it's like one, one, it's about five kilometer scale height for an Earth or a Venus, which is one two hundredth of one ten thousandth the area of the parent star. It's very, very tiny. Um, here's a cartoon of the science. Uh, Tim showed a similar cartoon. Just to point out that we do have more information than just the primary transit. We have the secondary um, occultation, secondary eclipse, and we have the phase modulation. The, the primary transit gives atmospheric information, but what we're finding is that hazes that tend to precipitate out at low altitudes are, are precluding us from seeing deep features. So the features are often very shallow because of the haze layers. That problem is ameliorated a little bit if you go to the secondary occultation where you're looking at emission from the entire surface. But I just wanted to point out that when you're, when you're talking about secondary eclipses, you're really talking about thermal emission from the planet, not necessarily reflected light. And there's a small subset of planets that are going to give you enough thermal ish emission to achieve a signal. Um, so we're very restricted in the planets that we can subject that technique to. Okay, um, TESS is yielding planets near the solar system. This is necessary. We need the brightest stars in order to do atmospheric characterization no matter what the instrument, what the platform. Um, TESS has already finished observing the southern hemisphere and we'll finish the first year of the Northern Hemisphere this summer, so very soon. You can see that there's a gap, which is at the ecliptic, which luckily was filled in to great degree by Kepler's extended mission. That's what the yellow footprints are that go through the ecliptic. Um, but TESS was recently awarded its own extended mission, and the first thing it's going to do is turn on its side and observe the ecliptic as well. So we'll have a nice stitching together of planets identified by Kepler with new data from TESS. And then, of course, after it finishes the ecliptic, it will continue to do the north and south um, surveys repeatedly. So we will get, eventually, longer orbital period planets from TESS albeit with large gaps in between. Um, here's a polar projection of planet discoveries that I pulled from the NASA Exoplanet Archive, and you see the yellow spray 
which is the Kepler detections in the constellation of Cygnus. You see some other sprays out to large distance. Those are also Kepler, but during, you know, across the ecliptic in its extended mission. The part of parameter space that TESS is focusing on are the planets within 100 light years. This is out to 6,000. 100 light years is the tiny circle in the middle. So I'm going to zoom in now to the 100 light year region, and this is what it looks like. The yellow points are the known transiting exoplanets within 100 light years, and the purple are the test discoveries. And I made this diagram some months ago, so I believe the number has already grown. And the takeaway message here is that TESS is making good on its promise to yield nearby transiting planets. You can already see that about half of them are from the TESS mission. Okay, so we want to do transmission spectroscopy with these. This is just a cartoon of a transmission spectrum with all the different kinds of molecules we expect to see. Um, things like water, methane, CO2. We'll have the Rayleigh scattering slope um, due to uh, scattering in the atmosphere or even clouds. With Hubble, this is all we see. This tiny little swath between like 1 and 1.5, 1.7 microns. Really the only major feature that's there for a planetary atmosphere is water. Um, and we've seen a compendium, many, we've seen a review, a couple review articles um, collating all of the different science that's been done with Hubble. Here's a sequence of transmission spectra. Um, it's done on a log wavelength scale which stretches out the 1 to 1.7 micron region um, where you see this nice water feature. Um, but Webb is going to launch soon. There's this wonderful video. Actually, I stole it from Courtney Dressing. I don't know where she found it because I've never seen it. Um, but you'll see, this is at the clean room at Goddard. And you'll see this gentleman on the bottom is literally turning the entire telescope around. I can't believe they let him do that. <laughs> but uh, how many of you have gotten to see the telescope in the clean room? It's at Northrop Grumman right now. If you want to make a road trip down to LA, there is a visitor center and you can go and see it in the clean room. Um, I got to see it about a month ago. It's quite spectacular. And so here's what we saw with Hubble. This is what we're going to see with, with Webb. So for exoplanets, I mean from 0.7 microns all the way out to five microns in time series mode, we'll be able to observe. And so now we'll have much more than just water. We'll be able to see carbon-bearing species like CO2 and methane as well. So it's not just the bigger aperture that is giving us the big payoff. It's also the broader wavelength range. Um, there are four different instruments. They've got different observing modes, different grisms um, you can use for different resolution. So if you're going to observe something faint like TRAPPIST-1, for example, you're probably going to want to observe it at the lowest resolution because you're going to be photon starved, which is the prism, prism mode. Um, but if you have nice bright targets, you can go to higher resolution and benefit from that. And so what are we going to measure with Webb? Well, there's this nice relation for the solar system between metallicity and planet mass. So metallicity is something that we want to measure. We've done that for a few exoplanets using Hubble, and this is what we get. There's kind of, it's kind of a mixed bag big error bars, scatter. It's further complicated by the fact that what you're really plotting is metallicity. What, you, what you'd like to do is scale it to the metallicity of the host star because that confounds the situation. Higher metallicity stars could yield higher metallicity measurements that make offsets. Um, but I wanted to point out that what's expected with Webb, the uncertainties that are expected with, with Webb look something like that. So we will be able to do a much better job of examining this correlation in great detail with Webb. There are ratios, abundance ratios, that are very interesting. They are used as planet formation diagnostics, like the C to O ratio, which gives you information about where the planet formed in the disk. So since planets migrate, that's a very nice piece of information to have. Um, C to O ratios have been measured for a couple of exoplanets, but not very well, and they're all very controversial. Um, this, <laughs> and understandably so, because they are inferred by measuring molecular species that have no carbon. They are inferred using water features. 
So up until now with Hubble, we haven't had carbon-bearing species for which to measure a C to O ratio. Um, but of course, that's going to change. And here's this beautiful simulation done for our web ERS proposal, our early release science proposal. Um, here's the simulated spectrum on the left from 0.8 to 5 microns, stitching together all of the different observing modes. You can see the water features, CO, CO2, methane. And on the right-hand side, it shows posterior distributions on the C to O ratio and the metallicity. The red posterior distribution is for data with Hubble. The blue posterior distribution is what we're going to get out with Webb. Beautifully constrained metallicity and C to O ratios. Um, Planet mass is often required information a priori in order to get out those posterior distributions um, because there can be a degeneracy between the mean molecular weight. If you have a low mean molecular weight, the atmosphere is lofted. But if you have a low surface gravity, the atmosphere is also lofted. So to break that degeneracy, you need to know the mass and the radius of the planet to pin down the surface gravity. Um, and so this is a simulation showing how that degeneracy exists. And so one thing that we're working really hard on right now is to take the test discoveries and to observe them with ground-based telescopes, the very best of them, in order to have masses so that we can hit the ground running when test launches, when web launches. And so we formed a collaboration with all of the UC exoplanet scientists um, we've got Courtney from Berkeley, myself from Santa Cruz, Paul Robertson from Irvine, Eric Pettigiro was just hired at UCLA, Stephen Kane is at Riverside, and then we partnered, so we all submitted one large UC proposal to do Keck masses, and then we partnered with Andrew Howard, who has Caltech time, and Dan Huber, who has Hawaii time, to get, to get masses. And this is, uh, given the time, I'll probably skip it. Um, Suffice to say that my approach up until now has been to keep a close eye on the test discoveries, to compute SNR proxies for atmospheric features with Webb, to sort the targets by that SNR proxy, to sample both planet and star parameter space uniformly, so that we can do a legacy-like survey with Webb to get a very broad vision of what exoplanet atmospheres are doing across parameter space. So what, I've, what I'm plotting here are um, plots that have the effective temperature of the host star on the y-axis, the insulation flux, which is related to orbital period and semi-major axis, on the x-axis, the symbols are related to the planet radius, but I actually normalized them and I broke them out by different bins. And I'm trying to cover this parameter space broadly. And just as one example of this, well, the purple points in these diagrams are the planets that have already been observed with Hubble. If they're dark purple, we saw something. If it's light purple, we saw no features. So you can see that very little has been done for planets smaller than six Earth radius. Um, here's an example, TOI 509, just to show you the fruits of our efforts. Um, here is its test light curve. It turns out, well, we solved a mystery that was confounding us that I won't go into, but I will get to the punch, which is that we have now measured better than three sigma masses for not just one, but two characterizable planets orbiting this very, very bright, like seventh magnitude star. So, um, and it's, uh, they're small, they're sub-Neptune, they're between 2.5 and 4 Earth radius, orbiting a G-type star. When we characterize the atmospheres of these planets, they will be the first sub-Neptunes to be characterized orbiting a G-type star. So we're very excited about this. I'll just end by saying um, what was written in the Exoplanet Science Strategy Report, that the search for life and even understanding these atmospheric diagnostics and understanding the lessons learned and how this relates to the diversity of planets is, an, is inherently interdisciplinary. Um, and it, it's largely in that spirit that I left NASA and went to UC Santa Cruz um, to talk to the planetary scientists, the Earth scientists, and to think about astrobiology more broadly. Um, and so this was one of the recommendations from the exoplanet science strategy to enhance opportunities for interdisciplinary 
science, and I would encourage NCAR to think along those lines as well. Um, and just to conclude that Webb and, of course, the ground-based telescopes that Tim brought up, I didn't include those because I'm so in dismay about the TMT and what's going to happen. I'm not quite sure it's going to end up in Hawaii, and that has big implications for exoplanet science. Um, Nevertheless, we are entering a new era of exoplanet exploration, and it's all about atmospheres. And given in Carr's history, I think we should, that guy should be right there on the front line. Thank you very much.